Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this edition of One World in the New World. I'm your host Zen Benefield and as always I'm going to remind you about those two words and phrases. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken it's Brahmi and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In la catch comes from the other side of the world the Mayan civilization and it simply means I am another you. So imagine if you had that kind of mind flow in your everyday encounters with others, what kind of change that might bring for your life and theirs as well. Don't know? Well, try it. Test it out. Great. Namaste. Thanks. So this week's guest is uh, Tony Michaelides, and he is just an amazing man. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Ta talk about a robust history. He's a music industry executive. He's a keynote speaker, a storyteller, a TEDx speaker. His, he's also an advisor for Magic Leap, which is a new virtual engagement scenario in process. Um, his TEDx talk was called Rebels and Rock Stars, Inspirational Stories from My Career in the Music Industry. And we'll talk a little bit about that. He's also uh, an alien of extraordinary ability when he has <laughs> moved to the U.S. from Britain. So I think that's kind of, yeah, he's got 30 years in the music industry. We can talk a little bit about that. Uh, right now, I'd just like to bring him on. Tony, glad to have you here. I'm delighted to be here, Zen. Thank you for having me. Um, the Magic Leap thing is kind of, I'm not doing that now, I'll just hasten to add, because they went through a major change you know this the ceo stepped down and they got a lady in from microsoft and laid a thousand people off and things but it was a great time while i was there I really oh, enjoyed yes. it. well you know and that kind of um that leads us into you know how do we deal with the constant change and things and and going uh, like like in in the beginning when you first um started your professional career and even had you know inklings of, of what you were doing there was an inner drive, I would imagine, that, that kind of took over. What was that like? And, and what kinds of things did you notice in that process from both inner and outer perspectives? Well, the thing is, uh, uh, I think when you get older and, and you look back, I think you appreciate it more then, you know, because I certainly have. It's kind Absolutely. of, I, I always thought it was like a roller coaster at the time. And then it was like, you stop. And then with doing things like this and writing a book and, just been generally been more vocal with the outside world, so to speak, rather than heads of music and TV producers and things. You kind of, you know, you, you, you kind of, I mean, I came from a generation of people that made it up as we went along, you know, so there were no music schools or things like that. But I actually quite like that because, like, I, I had a really interesting question the other day because there's, there's a piece in the book about going backstage and meeting Led Zeppelin when I was 15. And, and the guy said to me, you know, what do you feel that the music business taught you um, that would have helped you when you were a 15 year old meeting Led Zeppelin? I said, well, that's a really interesting question. I said, but probably not as much as you think, because I think like, you know, I learned my inter interpersonal skills on the school playground. You know, there was a six year old kid that was a bully and I didn't want to hang out with him. And then when I was in my teens and I was discovering girls, I had to stand in front of them and ask them out and fear rejection. So those are all kind of communication skills that are really part of growing up. So when your job involves literally getting into people's faces and having them listen to the music that you're promoting, I think those things help me subliminally without even knowing about it. Um, and I think now it just, as, as you get older, um, as you get older, you just become a gibbering idiot. <laughs> 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 well, you know, as a youngster, and, and I can totally relate to what you're talking about, and, and kind of the the fearless exploration of life from the perspective of which you're living it, right? And I've experienced that in, in numerous ways. And what did you find that, you know, in doing that, there's this kind of overall um, perspective and uh, acknowledgement, I guess, of those who step up get supported by the universe in the process, right? So what are the kinds of things that you noticed that just kind of appeared maybe magically in your perspective or, or maybe synchronistically or, or something that just seemed to make that um, 
congruence from the inner and outer a little more apparent? Interesting. Um, well, I think I think you um, I think that graciousness and humility come into the mix in as much as you start to appreciate what you have. You know, my job was like an extension of my hobby. So I never felt like there was never like, oh, Monday morning or anything like that. It was it was like the enthusiasm. I remember my first day in the music business. I, I was selling records out the back of a van in 1974 for like 25 pounds a week. But I went out every day to prove to the guy that gave me that job it was the best decision he ever made. So I kind of literally, like I said in the book, it was the job I never expected that I would never let go. Um, and as you evolve and develop and, you know, as you, as you like everything with something like, there goes the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's welcome to join us. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I kind of, you know, the things that kind of literally happen along the way, are, are you you develop an ability to communicate with people and everybody you meet is different. And I find that you learn from something from everybody you meet. It might not be something that you take into your world, um, but it might tempt you into doing something a different way, like five, 10, 15 years down the line, because you remember something that you thought might work, didn't type thing, which probably isn't the answer to your question. So just push me back into, into kind of where I was going with this because the dog interrupted. <laughs> Well, you know, we were looking at how those, um, the commitment that you had to being your best and, and the passion that you had for the industry and music in general, how that facilitated synchronistic and, and um, what we might have thought coincidental events that helped you along. I think I, I looked at and again, it, it's more so probably now than at the time, because there's more time to, to do it now, Zen. But I think the thing is that, you know, I, I, and I do have this thing in, in my head that I'm going to release a lessons learned from rock and roll, because you wouldn't think it's an industry that, you know, I did a thing at the uh, NAM conference um, just a couple of months ago, and it was, the, they gave me a title of rock star wisdom and the secrets of success. And I found myself like, as I was going through, I said, well, I'm not quite sure where rock star and wisdom come into the same sentence, but I know where you're yeah, coming. Yeah, it's, uh, it seems to be almost oxymoronic based on what we know. However, you know, for me, I, I know growing up in the 70s and, and the different types of music, especially coming out of the 60s and, and uh, uh, peace, love and harmony kind of generation where a lot of the musicians began to explore the inner worlds and it came out in the music as a reflection for others to kind of have a view of themselves and see where they're at in it. And for me, man, that was just amazingly introspective, first of all, because you got to sit and listen and contemplate. And then in the outer realm, Right then, you it's like okay, here I'm inspired to be different. Totally, yeah, and and that reflects on on you know the, the, what you learn from. I've worked with successful bands who kind of I didn't learn anything from other than the fact that people like their records. But then you get the people like the David Bowie's into your life, and and you realize like how much you know he he was you know fully focused on where he was going and what he was doing at any moment and constantly time. morphing in the process and, and being willing to do so i mean that took a lot of guts but if you think he came through the 60s with no success into the 70s and then the whole explosion of ziggy stardust and stuff so the thing is he wasn't prepared he, he was totally prepared to push out and wasn't wasn't in any fear of failure Right, so maybe he should have had the, the label, you know, an alien of extraordinary ability. Yeah, yeah, but he was. He, he was literally an alien. An alien to the extent of he, he would have been dead if he didn't, like, get over his indulgences. But that's what I mean. That's why he became a smart guy, because he got into the whole literally sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing to the extent of being a successful artist, but also a heroin addict at the same time. And yeah. where we lost, like, Brian Jones and... Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix, all those people who didn't survive the, the legendary age of 27 because- and Bonham and Moon. Yeah, Bonham and Moon, they overindulged to the extent of, of their, their iconic, but they kind of didn't really have too much too much time. You know, yeah. whereas, whereas Bowie kind of, um, he, he killed off his addiction at the same time he killed off his alter ego. Um, and that, I, I always say this to people, I, I find it quite incredible to think, you know, a guy waits 10 years for success 
and has one hit with Space Oddity and then reaches this, you know, real face and everything of the of the 70s and then like nips it in the body at its prime. I mean, who does that? You know, you know, you wait that long for success, but he realized that everything that came with it, which was his overindulgence in, in everything, would have led to, you know, we wouldn't be talking about him now because it would have been just a, a passing kind of fan type thing, but um, incredibly like influential. I think people like that, just looking at them, like, even though you're working with them, but looking at them from a distance and seeing like, and, and you know, quietly, your private moments where you smile to yourself and think, that was really cool what he did there or what he did that and things. And he was yeah. never frightened, never frightened of, of failure or things like that. So I found that that was- Nor should we be. No, absolutely. And I think the thing is that what I liked about Bowie when I was physically out on the road working with him was the real human elements, the, the graciousness, the humility, um, you know, just treating everybody the same. You know, a lot of the people who'd been with him had been there for a long period of time. So he even had the ability in this day and age where you look at like the new rock stars, like the game developers or whatever, they leave their job every two years where Bowie managed to keep the same staff. And when you, when you say the word staff, I mean, these are incredibly talented musicians who could get jobs anywhere in any band, but they would rather stick with this guy because of what they got out of it, which was much more than just turning up on a stage and playing for a couple of hours. Sure, it's the, it's the richness almost, it, it would seem anyway, maybe you can reflect on this a little, it's the richness of a family. Well, that, that that's what I was over time. Say. Because the thing is with Bowie is, is I mean, it's the little things that, that affected me. I remember when I first met him uh, to gig and I was introducing him because he likes to meet everybody he works with. And then the following day he was playing Liverpool. I just went up to say hi at the sound check. And it was like, hey, hi, Tony, how are you doing? You know, I mean, I was flattered that David Bowie remembered my name. I mean, how many people does Bowie meet? So you should remember my name, you know? So it's those kind of things that you take away in your private moments and smile. I remember one of the a day I'll never forget is, is the day that he passed, you know, I wrote a blog about it on Facebook, you know, and, and the fact that I, I couldn't kind of, I, I turned on the news, it was four in the morning, I was watching CNN and David Bowie's died and I'm like just staring at this screen, I get up to make some coffee and I'm bumping into things and it's like, how can this happen? You can't die, you, you invented the myth of an alien rock star, how can you possibly die? You know, ordinary people die. <laughs> you know? And yet his so music his last recordings were preparation for that. I mean, he was exactly. kind of telling the world, here's, you know, the perspective to look at going through what he was. Yeah, yeah. And also the fact that, you know, the great thing was he, he'd been with Iman for like 26 years. And when he was going through his like wacko period, when he had his first child, he would call Zoe Bowie. And he ended up being Duncan, you know, who's a TV producer himself now, but, 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 but the thing is, even when he had a child later in life with his soulmate and the love of his life, he became a dad. He spent, year, he spent a few years out of the public eye bringing up his child, you know, doing like real things in life, right. you know. And even, even, and I find this even incredible, even to the extent of, you know, I think he's, he, he died like, you know, he, he wouldn't die until he'd finished his album. You know, it's like ridiculous. Even when he died, that his own quote, he said, "I don't know where I'll be going, but uh, I, I, I don't know where I'll be going, but I know it won't be boring." Absolutely, Which is like perfect. Absolutely, Definitely. yeah, yeah. And special moments like that. You know, I, I had one um, actually reflecting on the the background that I have here of a shot from Earth from the Moon. I had met Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Uh, wow, ninety seven, and and uh, I was an event manager that for the event that he was speaking. We had 30 some odd speakers and about 5,000 people in attendance for the weekend. Well, being the manager, I had freedoms to go where I wanted, right? And so being respectful of him, um, I, I wanted to meet him. I saw him walk out into our green room, which was outdoors. Um, most of the event was outdoors and in, in tents and stuff. He pulled out a pouch of drum tobacco <laughs> from his back pocket and I'm like oh cool <laughs> I had one too because I was thinking about you know how do I honor him and uh, invite a conversation without feeling like I'm impeding on his space right so that gave me an opportunity to walk up and say hey do you mind if we share smoke together right? excellent yeah 
So that just softened him. And, and eventually we had several conversations and developed a, a level of trust to the point where he said, hey, I want to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody till after I'm dead, right? And he says, um, you know, when we were going down to the moon, there was a metallic silver cylinder spiraling around the LEM all the way down to the moon. And I know it was nothing from Earth. Oh, wow. But I couldn't say anything about that till after his death because be, uh, his agreements with the, you know, authorities that um, he wouldn't talk about that in public. So he died in 2016, and I, then I was able to start talking about that. Here's, you know, talk about mind blowing stuff, and and you know, uh, in relation to Ziggy and the reality that yeah, there are others out there that we don't necessarily need to be afraid of. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think the thing just, you know, the, 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 the thing with Bowie was, was, <coughs> you know, yeah, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it wants it's to talk to you, right? Crazy little thing. But yeah. the thing with, with, um, with Bowie was, was I always found him in, in my career. And again, maybe not, not to appreciate fully at the time, but, but certainly afterwards was the thing about people like that is they realize that it's not just about them. It's about a team of people like you mentioned you know so the fact right. that he brought the best out of the people around him from the roadies to the tour manager to the behind the scenes people and stuff because everybody who works with him wants to be good at, as good at what they do as he is at, at what he does you know so it's and, an incredibly inspirational journey for one of our work and that is such a reflection of what organizations in general Right, because this is a business, right? This yeah. is an organization, and he and his managers, you know, are leading that. And that kind of example is really what best practices in management now are all about: is instilling that, hey, everybody, just try to do your best, and we'll give you the support that, that we can in order to do so, and invite that general sense of support throughout the organization because every person is just as important as the other absolutely absolutely unfortunately with the music industry there's a lot of like uh, <laughs> you know sad stories from the beginning because right. you know in the type of business it i say it was really because it generated probably a lot more income than it does now through streaming i mean when sure. you have a physical sure. product and i think a lot of them you know that over enthusiasm where they kind of sign a record contract and then they spend half their life trying to get out of it or renegotiate it because the shrewd kind of you know types that any business that generates a lot of money and that was the general sense of, like of how and maybe you can re reflect on this a little bit you know in that kind of environment there was a maybe a deeper sense of competition in being able to move their agenda forward where now you know, they're further, further along in the product curve. Yeah. That interest is diminished and it, it's gone in another direction. Now, how do you see that evolution taking place in, in your backward look of how the industry's involved, uh, evolved, and, and what you've noticed in your own life as a result too? Well, the thing is, I've been in the States 18 years now, Zen, and... and you know, the thing is, the reason I came here was the music industry was kind of falling apart around me and I hadn't done anything wrong in as much as, you know, like the, the, the kind of, you know, if we're going to use the, the real interpretation of the word influencers, which is like the Bowies. And of course, a guy like Steve Jobs, you know, who changed, you know, the game, you know, that whole think differently thing with Apple. It was interpreted right. as exactly how he was running a company. And he came to the record companies with with what became iTunes you know Napster came along and, and like the record industry closed it down in the same way that the, the pirate stations in the late 60s which is what I grew up and turned me on to my Led Zeppelins and Pink Floyds and Dylans and everything you know mm -hmm. um, the BBC came along and closed them down and started their own radio network they kind of think well if that goes away we'll be okay so Steve Jobs approached the record companies with the idea of iTunes of selling singles and of course they didn't want to know because they were making all their money from selling albums because most people would buy an album after hearing a single on the radio, probably like two or three songs on it, but have to fork out a lot of money to get those songs all in one place. And then when Steve Jobs came along and they didn't want to know, then he came along and 
the rest is history. iTunes, so people were able to buy songs rather than pieces of work. Right. Um, and it, it, it changed the, the, the business like drastically because it, a lot of, a lot of comp a lot of record companies were having cutbacks and i learned from the, some of the greatest people in the industry the real music people and they, in came the accountants and lawyers and they started running it like a business and you know i'm not ashamed to say that you know i, I don't subscribe to that really i'm more of a creative and i want to work with creatives than, than work with business people who are just looking at market share and you know, and satisfying shareholders and things, which does happen in the industry with the major labels. But you see a lot of those people that, you know, my one of my mentors was Chris Blackwell, who, who, you know, I've just read his book, you know, The Islander. And he started with bringing Jamaican imports in from, you know, to sell in London out the back of his car and stuff. And and, and I ended up working for a label whose records I'd bought as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. which, which I still can't believe to this day. So in the 60s, I was mining traffic in Spooky Tooth and, free and stuff like that bob marley you know and then all of a sudden i'm getting all these records for free and they're paying me i mean how weird is that so the the <laughs> thing is with with the industry I, I find it really sad but the thing is that you look back at those times about artists making a statement then and you know I, I don't know if when we were chit chatting before we went live with this so to speak um i told you about that program on apple tv which um is called 1971, the year that music changed everything. And it's phenomenal, it's an eight part series. And you know, like nowadays, you, you take, it takes, you know, the whole Josh Rogan Spotify thing. It takes Neil Young to come out of the woodwork, like a 78 year old bloke, you right. know, to make a statement about something like that before anybody treads daintily onto the back of Neil Young. But you've got to remember is Neil Young makes more money from one gig than he does from Spotify in an entire year. So he can make a statement. But when I was watching this 1971, the year that changed music, you know, where you have kids marching against guns now in the street, it was the musicians that were making the statements. I mean, I always say this, Bob Dylan didn't stop the Vietnam War, but he made kids aware. You know, Crosby, Sills, Nash and Young with, you know, about the Kent State University, Ford Eddie in Ohio, you know, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? You know, even the Who won't get fooled again. They were all when these songs kept coming out of the TV, I thought, oh my God. And I, I, I put them all together and they were all using their power yeah. as influencers in the real sense of the world, uh, the word to, you know, because people hear them because right. they idolize them and they respect them and they, they, they're, they're like on a pedestal. So if they come out and say things, not like the jerks nowadays that are misinformation <laughs> again all over the place, but this is the world we live in now. But this right. was this was like a happy place, you know. And they Absolutely. would all congregate into. I did it myself, you know. I went went to um, a festival, what Woodstock, but it was a festival in the north of England called Bickershaw, you know. And it had all my favourite bands on, and we, we were like, um, it was just raining all the time. We were thrown around in mud, and the Grateful Dead paid for six and a half hours. <laughs> you try and mention that to people now, it's like, are you off your head? <laughs> no, I just had assistance. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> oh God, nice one. I can't follow that. <clears throat> you know what I mean? It was kind of like it was a different time. And if if you look at the other end of the scale, where the Dixie Chick, Dixie Chicks made a statement about Bush in his time, right? And then they were over, you know, because they forget that their shareholders are all part of corporate America. So you can't right. go in the media moguls have in, have charge of the, the narrative and Absolutely. anything that goes against it's going to be squashed. You know, one of the guys that in the seventies that, um, cause I was still a youngster then, but at 71, I was just a freshman in high school or actually eighth grade, uh, Barry McGuire. Yeah. And I, Later in life, a friend of mine put the new Christy Minstrels back together again. Wow. In their 70s. And Barry came along. He'd been booted out of New Zealand because he had a pacemaker and they didn't want to support him there. And he wow. married a New Zealander. So they booted him out. He came back to the States and, and things just kind of fell in place. Well, I got a chance to sit with him for several hours at, 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 during the the tour and, and it was like a brother from another mother and yeah. the stories that he had and and you know eventually actually becoming a preacher and wow. so he took that message of the eve of destruction and actually made a life 
for himself with that in talking about doing the right things and eliminating aggression, right? Yeah. Yeah, really. I'm surprised if you married a woman from New Zealand, they slung him out, you know, you would have thought they wanted to keep him there. Well, one would think that, the, you know, their healthcare system, you know, he well, was, yeah. Uh, yeah. had some existing conditions that they didn't want to help support, uh, you know, yeah. later in life. So, and, and I understand that everybody's got their rules and regulations. And so it, it all worked out, especially for me, you know, meeting one of my childhood idols later in life and, and actually becoming friends yeah that, that's great though because they, they become real then you know because you've, yeah. you've every time you see his name now you look at him differently because you're a guy you, that you sat like you with with your with your friends you see every day you know and right. um, that's great because it humanizes people and i think that's important as well and and like i said before you know the, the biggest artists are, are the easiest to work with because you know because the way they approach things you know and and they they don't abuse people just because they're more famous than them you know they realize that those people have played a part and they take care of them at the same time so when the money comes in it's not like well the money came in because of my talent and my, the talent around me so i'm not going to abuse that by just thinking oh well you know you're nothing without me um and then you get the young whippersnapper ups, upstarts who think they're like you know setting the world alight and you kind of smile at them and just think you'll learn See you down the line, kiddo, you, know, you know, and I've seen a few of those as well, and I've always been right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, and, and you learn over time. Now, how do you see this transition um, between the whippersnappers, right, and, and the mm, self-serving attitudes, let's say, and how do you see that evolving? What are the kinds of things that you noticed, um, not that you had any of those, but I think we all kind of hedge the edge every oh, once in a while, right. right? So how did you find that or observe that and, and having that place, first of all, of observation, being able to watch everything as you were, um, tremendously advantageous for growing uh, an awareness, let, let's say. So how did that growth in awareness, what did you see were the key factors in moving from that whippersnapper state to a little bit more wisdom in recognizing that you really need to treat people well. Myself, or what did I see from others? Because I'm fortunate with that stuff. I would say from both perspectives, I think are valuable. Well, I think I think the thing is that uh, I felt like to take a band like you too. They were kind of learning their trade when I was learning mine. You know. Mm -hmm. So they were very inquisitive. They wanted to ask all sorts of questions. They wanted to know how the whole business worked. And they were a great, like, like if, if you were in kind of the legal profession, you would, you would have you two as the perfect case study, you know, because they were offered a deal when they were 18 year old. They just won a talent competition in Ireland and CBS Ireland offered them a deal. And they turned it down as 18 year old kids because they didn't have a manager. I mean, again, it's, the, it's a bit the David Bowie thinking, thinking, who would do that? You know, you're that age, you get offered a deal with a major label and you say, no, thank you. Uh, but the thing is, the rest is history, literally, because they got the manager, they got the right manager, and they grew and morphed in a very real way that bands through going and, you know, having seen them physically playing to 11 people, four of whom came with me in a pub in Manchester, you know, and then seeing them grow into the stratosphere, you kind of, pretty much apart from all the behind the scenes things that go on you see how it happens with certain artists and how it doesn't with others and you don't want to sit there and predict failure or anything like that but i do feel that you know there are a lot of different aspects to it like for instance you could have a situation where you got to know a band or a lead singer in a band really well and then like all of a sudden like He's a little weird one night, you know, and you, you know, instead of like getting stroppy with him, what's your problem, you know, and all that, you can, you can, you just go up to him, put your arm around him and say, you okay, you know, do you want to talk? And you've got to appreciate that some of these people, Zen, when, when they're kind of going out and playing for 30,000 people a night and being adored, and then they have to go back to an empty hotel room. Well, you know, whether or not it's empty or not depends on the lifestyle. You know, we all know what the right, others right, are. Right. But the point is that, that, you know, that guy might, rather be at home with a pizza watching a movie with his missus who's just had their kid their sure. first kid and he's just going out and playing and, and there's a perspective of, of being alone in front of thousands of people oh yeah yeah too, right it, so there's it, that even though the connection with the audience takes place through the music 
there's still that interpersonal relationship that pretty much only happens off stage. You see, I, I have this kind of, you know, <laughs> maybe it's just me talking out loud, but you know, it doesn't matter how famous you are or- I'd like to hear you talk quietly, uh, talk what? silently, right? That, that'd be a feat. Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to show yeah, up? talking out loud, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, it was there, I had to make a joke yeah. about that, right? But I think I think the um, the thing is that oh hang on I forgot what I was going to say then oh I apologize I, I, I you are to blame yeah I'll accept responsibility for that as I do everything um, I'm in charge of my life and nobody that's, else is right that's all right it's your podcast <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, I, I think the thing is that I think the thing is with an, with a job like I had. And I, I kind of, this, this, I have my own private moments where I kind of pat myself on the shoulder, you know, saying, you did well, like it, you know, you did, because I kind of, I, it was, an, it was an incredible learning curve. Because like I say, you, you, I remember going on YouTube once and, and no, it was on Udemy and seeing a course. Because um, somebody said to me, oh, you do really well with this, you know, because they have a big audience. They, you know, they, you don't make much money out of it. They're based on volume and things. And I went on, I saw that there was a, a there was a, a course, how how to be successful in the music industry. And it was by a Canadian white rapper. Well, Canada's notorious for its white rappers, you know. And I just thought, what a con, you know. So I did my own bit with all the BS behind me. And I stood in a chair right in front of all that. And the first thing I said was, let me tell you, this isn't a how to do business. There are no two bands that are the same. There are no two managers that are the same. There are no two labels that are the same. And it really was a kicking him in the throat type thing. Because I thought, you want to go out and tell people that all you've got to do is spend 20 bucks on your course and you'll be a multimillionaire rock star. I don't think so. You well, know? and you know, that kind of process, or if you're a Canadian process, <laughs> today is ubiquitous in people online saying well here's you know telling other people how yes. to make money well what they're doing is just selling their own crap and, and getting other people to buy into it now you mentioned something earlier that i thought was profound and i want to go back to that and that was the curiosity that these guys had and gals had and have for learning and understanding, you know, how does this work best? Not having that prescriptive notion of we know what's best and that's all we're going to do, which kind of comes from the A&R guys, right? Um, however, how did that learning process affect you? And then in, and I'm sure it came out, I know it came out in your talk um, in, in your book as well. What were the? What do you think the essence is of switching that I know it all to I don't know, and I need to learn how to ask? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think that applies to everything. I mean, all these words now, like that, are, that are trendy everyday words in business, like you know, managing creativity, innovative management. They're the two biggest buzzwords in business school today. I was kind of subliminally managing creativity every day of my life with the yeah. people around. And another big word is collaboration, you know, where, and, and, you know, I say, I don't know, I'm, I'm not very savvy in business, but I am a good kind of A&R person when it comes to employing people, because I employed people who nobody I ever employed in, in 25 years of having my own PR company had ever worked for a record company. I just employed people that I felt had that certain something, you know, in the same way that I said to you before, when I got my job at 25 pounds a week selling records at the back of a van, I went out to prove to that guy that it was the best decision I ever made. I like to think I empowered those people. And I said, I'll give you one piece of advice, whatever you screw up on, I'll pull you out of. And it wasn't threatening them with their jobs or anything like that. It was just giving them the comfort of knowing that yeah. go out and learn You're your- You're kind trade. of a forerunner of the strengths movement, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Now, but go out and learn your trade, how I learned mine and everything, because they developed their... I said, I don't want you to be... I don't want you to be like the, the new me. I said, two me's would be unbearable, you know. Go right. out and make And, and if you got two, you don't need one. But the, Exactly. But right. the, the, the secret to success, for want of a better word, in that arena, as much as anything, was 
I think what collaboration and delegation, you should, you know, I used to, I had a girl come in. Well, basically the story is a good one. She, she came to work for me. She phoned me up from, she was at Cardiff University. And she said, I'm going to move to Manchester. And I got been told that, you know, you're the place to go and I should come and work for you. I said, well, that's very kind, you know, said, but there's no room at the end, mean, meaning we weren't looking for staff. So she said, well, listen, I'm coming to Manchester at weekend. Do you want to have a drink? I said, yeah, we're going to have a drink. It's no problem. Um, so we got together and she had a drink. And she said, like, um, she said, I come and work for you for nothing. So it was like, well, I can't really say no to that. But I'll tell you right. something. I said, you know, I said, you got to understand that we're kind of, we play a part in people's careers. So I can't send you out with an eyes and run the risk of you learning your trade at the same time. I can put you in the back seat with the guy in, with the artist in the front and the other yeah, person. Do it right along. Do it and you can learn. I said, but you know, you, you know, you'll be making cups of tea and coffee, but guess what? I make cups of tea and coffee. Meaning the art of delegation is you're not afraid to give people a job that you would always do yourself, you know? And right. I think the th with the collaboration side of things is, and again, this applies to everybody in any business then, is the moment you think, you know, you know it all, I mean, complacency is an understatement to say that sets in. You never know it all. And I think now when you look at things like, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say struggling, but I'm a lot slower at embracing technology and things. All the things that could power me into a new world uh, take a lot of time because it's not where I came from. I came from, you know, things like this. I didn't right. have like kind of downloads. It's symbiosis of uh, leading and learning. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, so, you know, and like you I said, the people I employed, I mean, you know, two guys went on to, one guy went to national radio. Um, my intern went on to manage Coldplay. Three people started their own companies. So I kind of, you know, that was their kind of initiation, if you like, you know. Sure. They, they kind of came in and then they got the confidence to go out and do their own. And I had people go out and make more money than I did. It didn't bother me. I was just really proud that I gave them like a, a starting block, so to speak, right. you know. But I do think all those kind of words that, that fit into everyday, well, not necessarily corporate life, but the real world are, are things that, you know, and so much of it is, is, you know, you have to have that zest and desire to constantly be a better version of yourself, I think, you know, where, where you kind of, and I, I you, you see, the thing is like this huge void out there that's the internet. But then again, on the other hand, it's where we met, but we met through the right kind of, you know, connection sure. so to speak so, so it's like a global brain that that has all kinds of different connections based on your attention intention and interaction right? exactly and maybe that's a frequency based thing which does have a lot to do with music i'd like to draw back the uh, attention speaking of to what you mentioned about what current best practices are in business today and the two things that they mentioned are most important, and that's creativity and innovation, right? Yeah. Creativity, you didn't mention innovation, but they kind of go hand in hand. And yet, we've known that, you've known that for most of your career. Why do you think it's been so difficult for, let's say, the masses or, or the general corporate world to catch up to recognizing that, Attitude's more important than skill set. Yeah, I agree. I agree totally. I, I think, um, you know, we, the, the thing is, it, the, there's this, like, huge void out there with, with everything being available, like, you just, what do they need me for when everything's on Siri? You know, you want any questions answered, you, you just go to your computer. You just ask, yeah. But I, I always, I, I always you know pride myself on a real world education you know the fact that, that you you learn i always think it's a bit like i mean you don't learn to drive until you pass your driving test it's not until you're out on the road on your own that you learn those things <laughs> i used to steal my comp my mom's car when i was 15 a year <laughs> before i got let's sneak out at night that's how i learned how to drive <laughs> um, but you know uh, but i think i think you um what was the start of the question what did i how do you see that innovation and creativity oh, yeah, being yeah. brought back, brought into the world now and the process in which it's being um, dispersed, let's say? Well, I think all the things now that, that you know, you, I mean, if we go back to the, you know, innovation and creativity, again, we go back to David Bowie, don't we? The, the fact that to never rest on your laurels. I mean, I remember a company in, 
in the UK, like Marks and Spencers, you know, um, and they were really successful. They, they, you know, everybody used to go there. And all of a sudden, another store came along, and they, their kind of profit started to, you know, decrease. But what mm -hmm. they didn't realise was the fact that there's always going to be somebody coming on to take your crown, just because you've had the mantle for a while. And that applies really to, um, to, to a lot of things, really, because you can't just rest on your laurels thinking that, I mean, I mean, do you remember the days of MySpace, you know? So as we're talking now, um. as, as we're talking now, you've got to, yeah, you've got to look at um, social networks and things. And we might not be talking about Facebook. Who knows in two years time? They might, oh, do you remember? Oh yeah, Facebook. Yeah, what happened to yeah. them? Because something else comes along because people think they take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and it lights the fuse in their head and they think, well, but we can do this with it. Because if they have the ability to understand, you know, the, the process of getting to people, because don't forget, I mean, even, even like I go back to when I was in Manchester, I did my own radio show for 12 and a half years. It broadcast to the northwest of England. I had like 70,000 listeners, you know, which was good. And it was, it was real. I was queuing records up and in jingles and winding reel-to-reel -reel tapes up. So it wasn't like pushing buttons and everything. Oh, yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, but it, it, was, it was incredible. Whereas you think like, like nowadays... Um, Every part of the process has, has kind of changed, you know, because I do a radio show now. Um, well, I'm also going to be doing another one. It's an internet station in Manchester and another one in, in France, the south of France. But the whole world can listen to it. Yeah. Because yeah. they just have to get on the computer. So, so and that's the ability of, of you see, the thing is with, with the record industry is I don't really take a deep dive into it because there's not that much of it interests me people say you miss your job i said i don't really miss it because what is there to miss i mean my job doesn't really exist but i think the thing is that you know i i, I used to thrive on the area that was called artist development whereas you you nurture them you, you like with the u2 you take them into every crappy little radio station to try and get an interview that goes out of one o'clock in the morning on a tuesday or something not on a big station just to get them some visibility and you like, you watch it bloom and blossom, you know, like a flower. Um, and, and we live in an age of instant gratification. You know, American Idol comes along, you know, and, you know, you have a bunch of unknown people and then the judges become bigger than the, the, the talent, supposedly. But we live in an age of, like, reality television and stuff like that. And, and there's, there's, I mean, I, I, I go to extremes in a way. I mean, I could make a record, right? I can't sing and I can't play, but I could make a record. Well, there's something wrong with that. You know, if I wanted to go and play for my favourite football team, I would have to have a certain amount of talent. Right. But with technology that's available, you could put together something. And if you have the right infrastructure around you, you could be successful, but not through talent, just through like the yeah, ability the to... Yep. You understand <clears throat> how to put the pieces, <clears throat> excuse me, how to put the pieces together in some kind of order, but you don't necessarily have the the feel for it i know you know my wife and i are both musicians she's a classical pianist and i've been a progressive drummer for most of my life just because it's the most exciting to do especially and you're older than 27 you made yeah. it. <laughs> um, it it's just a, and it's a different you know anybody can play a score yeah right with training it takes a, um, a sensitive musician to be able to take that to the next level like Bowie did, right? To where you can feel the movements in it. It's not just a construct, it's an embodiment. But don't you feel the collaboration there where, you know, you're- Absolutely. You're, you're like a progressive drummer, like you say. Don't you feel that if you have the right bass player and the guitarist and the singer around it, you become a better drummer? Oh, absolutely. Because you know, it, it's um, Mahaley, Csikszent Mahaley. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. Um, he wrote a book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. And he akins flow to a jazz quartet jamming. Right? Yeah. There, there's no score. There's not. It's just you leap in, you lose your ego, you lose time, you lose you into the mix. And everybody's better as a result because you're communicating with each other. You're having a conversation musically that can be, and I mean, for some of our stuff, it was exquisite. Other stuff, not so much, right? 
And I don't know if it depends on your biorhythms or, or, you know, the mood of the day or, or, you know, how the moods of the different musicians, all of that has an impact for sure. I think that's, that's a great way to look at it. Now you're a musician, you see, so all of a sudden, like, you, you know, you think a, a lot of the best stuff came out of musicians jamming because you get in that place and, you know, all of a sudden a riff might come along and, and then you don't really know where it's going to end up. Right. But you up with like something that's incredible because it's a collaboration everybody's putting their bit in so all of a sudden as the drummer's doing this kind of thing the bass player thinks of you know the bass lines that he can accommodate into that and then all of a sudden the guitar player will know when the solo's ready to come in and you'll yeah. be drumming you'll be going because ah. exactly. it's, like, it's experimentation and it's it's like that's what music should be like it shouldn't be and you can't think it you can't no. think it it's just part of your being in that yeah. moment but you see the, the the thing is you can have these we could be talking for like five hours about this because of a love for music but the other thing is there wasn't much else when we were growing up there wasn't like netflix and amazon no Prime, there wasn't all the streaming things there wasn't like gaming you know kids in front of computers and stuff and you know blowing this up and blowing that up so we had music and, and we had like films going out but not like every five minutes of new blockbuster and everything like that so we came from a different generation but i think the thing is you 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 grow up into understanding a lot better as to how it is now and i think because i mean here's a prime example like again i'm not a musician but the thought of people listening to my music on here right. would horrify me because you sit there and you try and make the best possible sound and and you think people are sitting there in front of Tannoy speakers and listening to it. But oh, yeah, yeah. Like Journey's first album, they even had on the back cover, you know, please play this album to the highest possible volume in order to appreciate the, exactly. the musicianship, yeah. right? And having, having the uh, guts to even say that, because you, you see, if you said that to kids nowadays, they think, oh, God, what a nerd, you know. But right. the thing is, uh, and I kind of, I'm quite honest about this, and as much as, you know, because basically when people ask me where I'm at now and, and they find out what I did, I said, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I can't do what I did. So I'm writing and talking about what I did, but trying to do it in an inspirational way that will sure. not necessarily mean they're going to be as big as the Bowies and the U2s. But, you know, when I when I talk about how I got my job um, and I told you about, like, you know, the, the I went out to prove to me it's the best thing. The other thing sure. was. You know, I was working, at, I, it, I've got it, you know, right at the beginning of my book. I said, I, you know, I, I went to further education college, which was perfect for people like me. We were done with school, but not quite ready for work. So I had two years of like, you know, busking it, so to speak. I became social secretary, which was the guy who booked all the bands. It was 70% girls and 30% guys. So it was, wasn't hard to get the date. It was a great place to grow up, college. And then when I left, I needed a job. Not that I wasn't ambitious, but I needed a job to spend my disposable income on right mm -hmm. buying records and going to gigs you know because that was my life those were where my friends are and everything like that and, and you're one of the rare guys that had the opportunity to make your love your living I, well yeah but but the but the other thing i was going to say there Zeb, which i think is, a, is is a valid point is you know i got on the train and i picked up a copy of the manchester evening news and i was flicking through because you'd normally I'd, I'd get it to to you know to past the journey on the way home but i'd look at like what gigs were happening and you know maybe it was a review of a band or something like this but for some reason i i scouted through the classified section i saw this job for a sales representative for record company and i kept staring at it on the train you know with my one hand like holding myself up on the right, right. and then like gazing out the window to the extent that i missed the stop and then i got <laughs> home still started thinking about it i went to work i started gazing out the window but what i did was i went down to the local HMV shop, rifled through the section and found out it was a folk and jazz label. Well, I was buying Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple records, you know, and Pink Floyd. What did I know about folk and jazz? But the interesting thing about that was all my friends who went to the same gigs and bought the same records could have all applied to the same job that was in the local paper. But I applied for it. But, but my thinking was, I don't have a job in the music business. If I don't get it, I still don't have a job in the music business. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Right. So, you know, you can call it like innovative entrepreneurial whatever. I call it flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah. So the fact that the fact that I kind of at 19 and a half at the time reached out to try and go for a job that isn't really a job, it's just a dream, you know. 
Um, and it changed my life, you know, because... Absolutely. And, it, and how often do we really, and this is one of the reasons why I named my coaching business, Be the Dream. Yeah, yeah. Right? It, because we all have one. Why not? We're our own, you know, cheerleader or worst enemy, depending on the direction we go. Now, you mentioned something earlier about the, what boils down to the generation gap, right? Yeah. How do you see, and this is one of the things in, in the world, and especially in the work world, there's multi-generational activities, right? They're across the gamut, how do those, or how do you see those generational gaps, uh, or what elements do you see that actually bridge them? Well, like I said before, my, my mission, if you like, is, and I find myself coming out with my own quotes, you know, like old enough mm -hmm. to remember, young enough to dream, you know, which is kind of like <laughs> romantic, but realistic as well, you know, sure. and another sure. one that, that is like, if you, if you, if you believe it enough, it won't be hard to convince others, you know, because people buy into the person that you are and thinking, well, this person is, you know, well, not invigorating, but inspirational, you know, if, if that person comes into my team, then they'll inspire others and things. And I think, um, I've gone off the plot again here. Um, what plot? Um, Did we have one? Yeah. What was, what was the, what was the start? Are we you plotting? Oh my no. God! <laughs> it's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. No. What What did you say at the beginning of it? Oh, uh, guys, you know it, it's um ah, it, it's kind of stream of consciousness. I, I sometimes I forget too, right? We were talking about the generational gap and oh, sorry, how yeah, you yeah. see it being bridged. Well, the the thing is now is and, and and again I wrote this. It's on one of the pages of my website, and it's like I feel like I'm on a mission to help keep the legacy alive of some of the greatest artists that ever lived. Mm -hmm. So I'd I'd love to, as a hopeless romantic and you know dreamer all my life, I'd love to think that there's a time where people, you know, they 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 call millennials entitled, but millennials like they like things to be authentic and come from a reliable source. Those are the two ingredients, you know. Well, the reliable sources, for instance, if a millennial listens to us and likes your podcast and gets curious about you, then what they'll do is they'll say, hey, check this guy out. You know, he has a podcast, blah, blah, right. blah. Then it's not you or me. Their reliable source is their friend. So if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So they become your PR department. But you know what? I call it like bragging rights. That is no different Zep, to me going out with my pocket money as a 15 year old, getting the train to Manchester at nine o'clock on a Saturday, going into the local record shop, One Stop Records, where the staff knew me, they'd have like five or six albums there. I'd spend the day listening to them, right? And then I'd buy one of them if I had enough money, maybe two. And I couldn't wait to get home and have my friends like listen to them, um, you know, but, but, getting them to turn on to it, turn them onto it. But I found it. So it was my bragging rights. We so got a somebody, ghost in the machine, don't we? Yeah. So somebody finding your podcast, wanting to brag about it and turn other people onto it, but they still have the bragging rights. So it's not that big a distance. It's just like 50 years down the line. Right. But I, I, I do feel that, that those artists like that won't be with us again. They, they need to, their legacy needs to be left in place, you know, and I, I think, sure. that I think there's a curiosity factor with maybe a generation growing up that wants to, I'm, I'm about to kind of test that myself with my own storytelling on Facebook Reels. So you kind of light a fuse and you get them curious. And then, you know, the, the, there is a generation gap, but, but you know, that they're, they're not, everything's put in front of them. You know, it's like, even like if they want a meal, they can go and buy something that's pre-packed that they can stuff down their faces in seconds. They don't have to cook anything. They don't have to like find content. Content, right. for but that immediate gratification also has turned into muck enlightenment. And there's this facade of, of thinking, you know, we're intelligent, evolved, um, peaceful people. And, and yet when we're confronted with a, situation is challenging we certainly don't act that way now speaking of the and inspiration and things like that and, and getting people uh, engaged and, and it's funny you know my uh, audience actually is 25 or 24 to 35 it is the majority so it's working 
Um, really? so I'm hoping that we can, via these discussions, impart some wisdom to the younger crowd that's coming up so that we can all learn how to work together better, right? Yeah, and I think the thing, the thing is, any, any self-respecting human being is always going to want to discover things and find things, but sometimes they need pointing in, in a little direction, you know? Right. Well, that's kind of how we've evolved, you know, the, the other symbol in my background here is the logo for live and let live global peace movement of which i'm executive yeah. director now so this is one of those things where it's got two aspects a legal and a moral legal side is you know we need to do away with aggression it's allowed in the laws we need to calibrate them and enforce them such that no aggression happens at any level in society well that also brings with it a sense of free trade in the sense that with no aggressive actions toward those in trade to keep them from it in any way or to give permission to right there's still this everything needs to be available we cannot have anything illegal at that point because it's a personal choice as to how to or when to or even if to engage or imbibe or whatever that may be right and yeah that causes challenges for people who don't have boundaries and don't know how to limit themselves and yet uh, it brings that aspect of personal responsibility and and voluntary caretaking into the scene right and then the the let live side of it as being a good human you alluded to it earlier you know how do we be better on a daily basis how can i or how can you or how can we evolve together in ways that we can help each other and also the world to grow up and act like an adult <laughs> yeah, i think a good, a good way to to start that off is is to share the stuff that excites you know you with others and, and i think the thing is there's there's it's so vast out there with the, the the people growing up and this and that and everything and, and some responsibilities with the parents you know like if I, I mean my kids are grown up obviously but the thing is if, if you're bringing kids into the world now i think it's it would be much better not not when they're like you know crawling around at two years of age or anything but maybe you could just indoctrinate them into like what you grew up on by just having a music on in the background so somebody might say oh what's that dad or what's that mom instead of thrusting an ipad in front of them to shut them up so they can play endless mindless games right which just means that they get a bit of peace and quiet so they can watch tv and you can just sit for sure. four hours in front of your and iPad. there's some other advantages to parental engagement too and when the opposite happens you know the reason i'm saying that is i taught high school for a number of years and just because my kids i was divorced I had four kids and they were in high school they were two thousand miles away and i wanted to keep up with them yeah so, and i thought well maybe i can help you know kids garner a little wisdom i'd finish my mba and then got a teaching cert so that i could do that and in the process i found out that it was a rare parent that really wanted to be involved with their child's education and supportive of it. Most of them were distracted with other things and their kids suffered for it. Now, how do we do something about that? It's not, I don't know about indoctrinating, but it's an encouragement in the being better, being a better human side, right? That we have certain aspirations that we want to inspire others to adopt and promote but we can't do it forcefully. How do you see that in what you've been able to do and in the process of helping others to be better people along the way? What were the key points that you found were most advantageous to that? I think personally, I, and even just the fact that I managed to secure that job in the music industry, like I said, it was the job that I never expected that I would never let go. I, I, I see a sense of adventure, you know, I kind of, you know, I want to, you know, get up every morning with purpose, you know, I don't, I don't need to go on motivational talks and have people telling me how I get excited about life. Right. I just need to have the things that are around me. And it's not just the job, it's the people you put around you. So I went, I got offered the head of promotion job at Island Records back in the day, but I didn't want to move my family to London. So I created my own little niche. I thought, well, regional promotions were based in the region. That makes sense. 
So nobody told me to do that. I just thought it was a good idea. And it gave me enormous amount of, of you know, of satisfaction because on the one hand, it was my idea. On the other hand, it, it clearly worked because the record company couldn't think of that. They thought everything revolved around London. But I do think that, you know, I, I think the people that you work with so that when you come in, you get a genuine warm smile from somebody who's looking forward to seeing you come to work. Right. And then you all you are in the same thing together. So the, the end result is, as I said myself, I said, nothing I've ever done has ever been down to me. It's always been down to a team of people. But you have to have people wanting to, like I say, work together for the for the betterment of the, the greater cause, so to speak. And that's in everything, not music. Well, and you mentioned, you know, the, the fact that rather than move to London, you chose to be an ancillary factor. Yeah. And so what you were demonstrating that small groups of people outside of the cluster or the densely populated can actually have a profound effect with, a, you know, that core group of individuals that are committed to work together and, and helping each other to be better people and, and not just in their moral perspectives but they're building their skill sets and, and applying those in, in a way that's exciting fun um, and provides additional learning too because it is you know life's kind of an experiment we don't have a manual we well, do I quite, but i think it's buried inside of it and that's part of what's coming up now in these apocalyptic chats is that recognition that yeah all these things are built inside of us we're just bringing it to the surface now yeah and i think i think you can't we're, we're constantly evolving but it's it's for us to work that out not to be told it you know so that you know everybody goes through different periods of their life where you we've all done it we all look at things that we were we used to tell them rites of passage right where'd those yeah. go i haven't <laughs> heard that phrase mentioned for a long time <laughs> But you also have people that, that, you know, there's there's an element of fear in there and they, they sit in their comfort zone. And it's not to be about being judgmental to people. It's just that, you, you know, it's like I've heard lots of, you know, really successful people talk about these things. Like, for instance, Richard Branson, you know, I mean, what a lot of people don't realise is he's had more failed companies than most people put together, you know. But you don't hear about them. But he, 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 his way of explaining that is, is that, you know, I've never worried. Um, as long as it's been worth putting the Virgin name to, I've never worried about if it failed, you know. So he's not doing it for any other reason than he just thinks there's a purpose to do it. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Dust yourself down, move on. And I think right. if you look at the that entrepreneurial spirit with those people that have it, it never dies. They're constantly evolving all the time. I mean, they never sit on their laurels and because one day it might be over. Um, and some people, and that's what I love about bands who experiment, you know, not to keep going on about Bowie, but all of a sudden it doesn't mean that if you've had two successful albums that are fairly similar, that the third one should be, just be the same album with different right. tracks on. Because and that doesn't necessarily mean that the audience is going to flow with that. You know, perfect example, as I mentioned, Journey earlier yeah. their their first three albums were minus steve perry and i thought they were phenomenal when they brought steve perry mm, it, it shifted they they moved to a different style and the guys in the band weren't happy to begin with but yet that shift made them a global success whereas their previous style of music it was more well, like ainsley dunbar their drummer came out of frank zappa Right, yeah. they had, and Neil Sean from Santana, uh, Neil or uh, Greg Roy as well. So these guys were all, you know, seasoned musicians styled in a different type of music, and then they went to the popular themes of the day, and they didn't like it to begin with, and you know, it almost caused a breakup. Uh, and yet, because of the perseverance and, and their ability to work together, in at least in some fashionable way they were able to move forward and, and be quite successful now how do you see that with that kind of challenge and, and the move from one way to another in the process of an evolving society what kind of advice can you give to those who are in the throes of that so that they may be able to have a, a little less bumpy journey 
Now, well, not that the bumps aren't appropriate because we do need those in the process because that's how we learn. I think a lot of that has been governed by the climate of the last few years because, like I said, I'm doing I'm doing a series of of, of ebooks, lessons learned from rock and roll. So that's lessons in managing creativity, lessons in innovation, lessons in artist development, you know, lessons in communications, all things like that. But I've added to it to answer your question, you know, persistence and resilience because COVID has made us, you know, the, the ones with half a brain have stopped and thought, well, there's nothing we can do about this. We just have to learn to deal with it. And I think the thing is that where people are losing the plot, so to speak, that happens with people when we're all going to get periods where life ain't as great as it thought you thought it would, you know, any period in time, because you can't map out the future. That's kind of, and I quite like that in a perverse sort of way, not knowing <laughs> what's going on. But I've always had that. I, I never had... And no disrespect to say bank managers or bank managers back in the day, but if you went in as a bank manager, started as a teller and became a manager, you had a job for life because they'd move you to another branch if you're good to manage a bigger branch or anything right. like that. And there was a certain amount of security and you got your pension. Mine is a record. You get it played, you still have a job. You don't get it played, you don't have a job. So that kind of, in, in a weird way, it, it, it's exciting like because it keeps pushing you and it keeps sure. pushing you all the time. And I think, you know, life's about challenges and also about, you know, I look at some of the things where I, I seem to have moved to the right place at the right time. And something must have told me at the time that it was right, but I don't think I was aware of it at the time, if that makes anything like sense. But I do think that, that you know, to answer your question, I do think that the, the persistence and the resilience to keep going the end result being you want to succeed, but at any moment in time, you might fail. But it's the old cliche. I mean, if you fail, you just dust yourself down, move on again. You make an interesting point there, and I don't even think it, that you are aware you made it. And that was of trusting yourself. Yeah. yeah. You didn't know, but you did it anyway, right? Because yeah. there was something you didn't know how, where it came from, but there was that sense, if it makes any, I think was your comment and yeah it makes perfect sense now how do we make that sense common well you can't indoctrinate people you can't like bang away at them and, and you sure. know and, and nullify them into submission you, you've got to i think you've got to like um without it sounding pretentious you've got to kind of open their eyes to a different way of looking at things that maybe right. they have but some people don't have that sense of experimentation or, or adventure and it's not their fault you know they might have come up in a in a different background where well, sure. you know, there's That's nothing absolutely. wrong with it but sometimes like i always i always like the phrase of just lighting the fuse and standing back you know and seeing because i used to find it incredibly rewarding when i see people that come in and work for me for next to nothing and work their way up the ladder move on and you help them on the path to their success type thing sure and that's what I mean about, you know, I was never worried about employing people who might be better at doing things than I was. Yeah. But I do it's think... I like do... The, the live and let live philosophy, yeah, ex right? Exactly. Where you live, uh, it applied a little differently, you're living your life with an invitation and an ability to nurture others in the same process because you've been down that road and you know at least a few things and signposts and pathways that they might want to try out because they've been proven to work yeah i think the thing is i was a drummer did you um <laughs> this is my bass drum going all the way through this um, and i do think that that you know that that i think we're all help i think we're all oh, so we're on the basement tapes huh yeah the basement all right <laughs> all the attic tape um yeah. i think the thing is that realistically we're all in this together i think good people want to help other people i think the thing is in the same way that we we kind of a and r ourselves we have to see the skills that we have and make sure that we kind of make the most of them but we also need to surround ourselves with the people that will bring the best out of us so that we can bring the best out of them and i think that you know that some people i mean some people just go through life lazily they they don't have i mean i mean the, the music industry as it was when i grew up into it Nobody goes out on the stage unless they think they're going to succeed. 
but you're washing your dirty laundry in public, you know. I mean, it, it, people might spit at you or boo if they don't like something or go ecstatic if they really like something. But when you can see the whites of people's eyes and, and what it brings to them and stuff, you take that away and that helps you as an artist, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I think that ability for... for you see, the thing is, it, it's like... Uh, it, it might be different now. I mean, you know, we live in an age where... You know, everybody wants, you know, to be famous, you know, like instant gratification. And I've been working with Simon Cowell for seven years. I mean, I could see that manufactured, you know, turning artists and bands into something that they can market and promote rather than allowing them to develop, you know, internally with their own skills and come out with those killer songs and then just say, I wrote this, you know, and, and walk in. I mean, I go back to a story from Bruce Springsteen talks about in, in one of his books. Um, no, actually, Walter Yetnikoff, who ran CBS Records at the time when he did the, sold the deal to Sony. And, and um, Springsteen had just released um, uh, Born to Run, and it had been a huge success, you know. And then he came in, like you do with, at that level, you come in with your next record and play it to the head of the record company. And he played it, and, and um, it was Nebraska, which was just him and a guitar, you know. Mm -hmm. And Walter Yetnikoff said to him, he said... Um, he said, uh, I have to tell you, as the president of the record company, Bruce, I have to be honest with you and tell you that this won't sell um, as well as, as Born to Run, you know. Um, and Springsteen said to him, he said, that's okay, Walter, he said, but I have to do this. I have to make this record. And Yetnikov, to his credit, allowed him to do that. Ha let an artist indulge in the moment that he had to make it, the record he had to make in that moment of time in his career. And then they release it, it doesn't do as well. And the next record he brings in is Born to Run, is Born in the USA, which right. was like, you know, but that right. record might not have happened if the president had been looking at market share and what, you know, profits they could accrue if he made a more commercial record. He allowed him to indulge. And that is the ability to manage creativity from the outside. Sure, to allow looking in. That example was perfect in, in demonstrating that, you know, you've got to, whether it's a musician, an artist, a, a worker, you have to give them permission to do something their way with their passion and skill set. Then once you, it's like, understand, it's like the fifth um, habit of, of uh, highly successful people, right? You first understand before being understood. By understanding another, giving them space to be who they are with what they want to do, then builds that trust relationship to when you ask them to do something a little different in order, you know, or maybe something just next, right? Then they're more apt to do that with the passion and purpose that they had for their own stuff. Well, you're right. That's the simplest words as well. Trust, because trust is believing in people as well. You know, I mean, basic yeah. human ingredients that come into the everyday workforce. You know, you just don't have to take them from like a celebrity status into seeing how it worked. I mean, I do find that, you know, when you have success stories with artists, people listen to them differently because they're famous people, you know, so they sure. kind of. Oh, they must know something. They've been there. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. But they've also, they, they, you don't hear of the, literally the blood, sweat and tears that, that goes into like the, the, the grooming of a successful band. Well, yeah, because that makes it go, oh man, that just, it, because even, and I know for me, and I'm sure it probably does for you, when you go to those places that weren't fun and you bring them up in your memory and you ex re-experience them, them because you're talking about it, you can still kind of remain free emotionally because you've talked about it enough times to be able to be so. And at the same time, those emotions are still there and, and you have to deal with that ouch, right? And yet that has to be there because it's life, right? It's it is part life. of the process. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you, you kind of associate growing up with being like going from a child to an adult. But we never stop growing up, you know. I mean, like, I, I you know, I, I still act like a kid in public. I don't know who's growing up here, but, right? <laughs> but the thing is, you'll gravitate towards the right type of people because, I mean, we got on instantly because, like, nobody's trying to impress one another. Oh, yeah, we're just, we're just having like a chat. It's like. And the thing is, we. We'd also be just enough to slowly move in a different direction. That, but now you're stuck with me, so tough luck, Buster. 
Yeah, but the, well. The thing is, when you come from, like, like I told you that bit about, um, uh, you know, millennials, reliable source. Well, we can thank Dennis for being our reliable source, you know, bringing like-minded people Absolutely. together. Absolutely. Uh, Dennis being Dennis Pataco and exactly. uh, Biz Catalyst 360, which is how we got connected. Exactly. And also when, I, when um, you know, when I met him for Carthy Dennis and I was telling him, you know, I was doing interviews and stuff and this and that. And he, he said, oh, let me know if you want me to introduce you to some podcasts. And there he goes. He goes and sends me a list of, you know, the people that, clearly with the right people because apart from a couple i think i'm doing interviews with them all time thing and right. they're all different types of shows but dennis's ability to connect you know and 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 kind of just not 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 force feed but just slightly open the door so that we can do it together then type thing but like nowadays yeah, it? um gladwell right connectors mavens and uh what was the other term that he it was in this book tipping point yeah uh, and it, they're those kinds of people that just naturally are able to keep track of, of uh, and even provide um playgrounds if you will uh, they build them first of all yeah and then they share them and that's how people connect and that's one of the most um dynamic examples especially you know virtually uh and you know he's brought thousands of authors together and, and presented their material uh, just because he can and he still has the zest, the zest to do it you know the yeah. enthusiasm and and that's infectious because that enthusiasm rubs off on others but he also approaches you know it's like that a and r thing we keep talking about it's the ability to find the people that you know that are easy when i say easy not easy subjects but easy to kind of communicate with because they're all you're on the same playing field you're all thinking the same right uh, and we're always well you know like like <clears throat> the um friendship room and stuff where people share different sure uh, well and they may not be thinking the same they may just be able to be intellectually humble and psychologically safe for others yeah but right? you also be able to word... provide that kind of atmosphere but you also mentioned the word a while ago, the word curiosity. And, yeah. you know, that's great. Because, I mean, why would you ever, why would you ever want to lose that? I mean, who would want to know how their life was mapped out? Because you wouldn't feel the, the, the things that were the wow factor in your life. You wouldn't be as ecstatic about them if you just thought, well, you knew this was coming. And, and, even and that curiosity has got me sitting where I am now. Yeah, yeah. On the and, moon. And look, yeah exactly yeah <laughs> but you'll never lose it because i think that zest and enthusiasm because like i said before it's infectious you know if you're with if you're in the in the room with the right like-minded people it does creep up on you you know and and i like things where i've had conversations like this and something will crop up that a week's time something that got said might trigger something else off in your head in your own private moments you know and i i, don't, I wouldn't we be as you know uh, cruel as to say I feel sorry for the people that don't have it but I think some people need a bit more direction than others I mean I'm not answerable to anybody you know because I don't you know if you don't fit into my world good luck with the rest of your life it's not that I don't like you or anything it's just that I'm too busy trying to get my own act together right right well <laughs> Tony I sure appreciate you entering my world for a bit and allowing me to share that with you and and to be part of a great conversation that I hope and, and feel that can provide a lot of insight and understanding and maybe even some apocalyptic moments for others. Yeah, I really hope so. Yeah. I hope I didn't kind of, you know, veer off too much the subject matter. But well, this it's is a conversation. You know, this is a wonderful thing about conversation. <laughs> There's, yeah, I've got a direction we're going to go. And we went there and, and we explored things along that same path that, uh, circuitous as it may be everybody's different like you say and you get a different um, perspective talking to people in different you know oh, i am i have such joy in being able to have these conversations that are often so divergent it makes me grow and it also brings out some things that i may thought i'd forgotten but that, 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 that's what we were saying at the beginning Zen, the ability to constantly want to learn and evolve because yeah. it's not like you're safe because you've talked to so many different people from so many different walks of life 
that you know enough or you know it all. And there are people that are like that. It's like, you know, they, they just go slung and then all of a sudden it stops and they've really only themselves to blame. Yeah. yeah. I think life's, life's an adventure, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, who'd, who'd have been able to prepare for the pandemic, let alone have it thrust upon us. But Well, the one two things that happened with the pandemic, it gave us a wake up call. Yeah. And by doing so, it gave people the opportunity because of the obsession on self hygiene and sequestration, it gave them the opportunity to turn inward. Absolutely. And many yeah. of them did. Now, how do yeah. we come out from there and what kind of experiment do we want to play with as we move forward? And one of those things that came out of the pandemic was live and let live global yeah. peace movement, right? Exactly. Uh, and exactly. this show, my wife yeah. says, Hey, you really need to start talking to people again. You know, I came yeah. off a 30 year hiatus to do it. And it's been so enriching, just really? to meet, you know, and greet and, and have that truncated friendship for lack of a better right that's that lasts right because now that we've had this it's like okay we've connected in somewhere somehow we don't know when or how but that spiral will come back around and something really cool will happen yeah we'll definitely the world is our oyster sir yep <laughs> yep yep and we're that grain of sand depending on how big of <laughs> pearl we want to have right absolutely absolutely well thank you so much then it's been great fun oh i, I think I, I expected it to be anyway so there you go i did too <laughs> i did too uh, absolutely well thanks again okay namaste and in la catch thank you so much for sticking with us through this episode of one world in a new world i'm your host zen benefield and i will see you next time <laughs>